All right, well, let's go ahead and pray and get started and thank the Lord for this beautiful day. Lord God, we love you. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together as the body of Christ. Thank you for allowing us to worship you and honor you. You are so worthy of honor. You are so worthy of praise. We thank you for everybody that took time to come out here today to show you how much they love you and to just honor you with song. And we're going to read your word together and we're going to learn something from your word together today, Lord. Lord, I just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I need all you singers out there. We're going to do some hymns. We call this Hymns for Him because it's not for us. <laughs> i 
temptations Is there trouble anywhere of a voice yet, y'all, but I'm doing the best I can. I'm glad to be alive. I'm glad to have good singers in the crowd, too. Lauren, Lynn, Joe, all you good singers. All right, let's do a little bit of In the Garden and set the mood for worship, and then we'll uh, read the word. And 
the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him. Father God, we just thank you for a beautiful day. You have blessed us so tremendously, Lord. We want to return that blessing by just praising your name today and reading your word. And with that, I'll say amen and I'll preach. Amen. <laughs> I've been trying to get my voice back and it's coming slowly, but a little too slow. Pardon me for blowing my nose in front of you, but I got to do it. I'll get that out of Miss Abigail's way. I don't think you need a microphone in here, but just in case it, the video might pick it up. Ah. <clears throat> okay. I did some studying this week, and everything I studied was not what the Holy Spirit wanted me to share today. Because I, I got out my RV this morning and got alone with the Lord and prayed and I asked what I always ask and that is for the Lord to tell me what he wants me to talk about because I want to be his mouth I want to be his hands and his feet on earth I want to do what he wants me to do not what I want to do so this is not my opinion and this is not about me this is God's word and today's message is about God's word and I titled it, What Do You Believe and Why Do You Believe It? So, I'm going to turn this down a little bit because it's ringing. You don't need that really that much anyway. All right. We all have our own beliefs. We were taught things as kids. I know I was. I was taught a lot of things that actually were not correct. The theology that I came up under, some of it was correct and some of it was not. So... When I matured and the Lord got a hold of me a few years ago, uh, I started reading his word and I started praying and asking him to explain it to me. I'm a simple man. I need some things explained to me. I don't understand a lot of stuff. So I'm not a Bible scholar. I didn't go to seminary, but I like to say I went to the school of hard knocks. That's right. So, all right, so... We've, at our age, most of us have made up our mind pretty much what we believe, but do we know why we believe it? All right. In my notes, I wrote down here to ask you guys, do we all agree that this is the inspired word of God? This is the scriptures. This is the Bible. It is the NIV version. I like to refer to the King James to make sure that things line up. But pretty much the NIV is, is easier for me to understand because I'm a simple person. So, if we agree that the Holy Spirit breathed every letter and syllable in the Scriptures, which I believe that. If you don't believe it, I hope you'll come to believe it. So that's basically the foundation of my question to you today about what you believe and why do you believe it. And I've often heard, and I don't remember who said this, it's probably a famous preacher, but 
He would, he would say, God said it, and I believe it. Okay? He said a lot of things that I didn't agree with, and I ran from and rebelled against, and I've learned not to do that in my old age. If it's in God's word, whether it's, my, it's not my opinion, we have people that, um, churches nowadays, that preach basic heresy. And I'm not picking on other churches, but... I, I sat under a lot of heresy in my life and learned a lot of wrong things. So I've had to do what I'm going to tell you guys to do today, and that is turn to God's Word, read it verbatim, think about it, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what do you want me to understand? What do you want me to get out of this? There are different interpretations, but I want the Holy Spirit's interpretation. All right, I'm not a theologian. I'm a fairly new preacher, and I'll admit that I have much to learn. So I'm going to flip over here. I'm going to get to some scriptures here in just a minute after I get through my little preface. All right. How do we know what is truth and what is not if we don't know God's word? I'm guilty of not knowing what the truth was about some pretty serious issues in life because I did not go and read this for myself. I took somebody else's word for it. So... And that's another reason I like to sing the hymns because they have such, a, uh, such meat on the bone. What you're singing about is theologically good and it's wholesome and it, it lifts up our Lord. A lot of the praise and worship songs nowadays don't do that. It's all about the people on stage and, and uh, how good they can sing. And, and I freely admit that I don't sing good, but that's not why I'm here. All right, so... Do you take time to actually read it for yourself and try to understand it? People say, well, God doesn't speak to me. Well, sure he does. Maybe not audibly out loud, but he speaks to you every time you read this book. This is how he speaks to us. So if we don't read this word, we're basically saying, I don't care what you have to say. I don't want to hear from you, God. My ears, my ears are closed if we do not actively open this book and read what he has for us. All right, so everybody from kindergarten on up knows what John 3.16 says. But the world reads that and stops. Okay, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, blah, 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 blah. John 3.16, we've heard it a million times. But... Do you read John 3, 17 through 21? If you want to turn to that in your Bible, or if you have a Bible app, or if you just want to let me read it to you. John 3, 17. I'm going to start at 17 because we all know what 16 says. All right, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. People stop at 3.16 and they don't get to the good part, which is what I'm about to read. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I'm going to stop there for a minute and shoot from the hip. I played on a song not too long ago called If I Were God. First of all, I'm glad I'm not God because I wouldn't put up with a lot of stuff he puts up with. But if I were God, and I sent my only son, who was perfect for us, and then I did the thing, not being God, me being buddy, did the rotten, awful stuff that I did, and just slapped him in his face, I would have struck Buddy down a long time ago. Buddy wouldn't be standing here. But we serve a loving, gracious God that's patient with people like me. I'm sorry, I didn't want to get upset. But it, it breaks my heart to think of the stupid stuff that I did after what he did for me. So, he sent his only son. And the next verse, 19, says, this is the verdict. Well, where do you get a verdict? When you've been judged. All right, so we're judged whether we believe in him 
and we're not condemned, or we don't believe in him and we are condemned. This is the verdict. All right? He gives, he, he lays it out here. Light has come into the world, but people, Buddy Hyatt back then, loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. People are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. I'm so thankful he waited for me to pull my head out of my rear end and come into the light. You too, Miss Lynn. So that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Okay? Think about that. Whatever you do, you're doing it in the sight of God, whether it's rotten like I was or whether it's righteous like we are today here worshiping the Lord. We are worshiping not only by coming and singing, but it's an act of worship to show up. It's an act of worship to give of your time, to put on your righteousness that he only allows us to have through his son. You know, I'm not a righteous man without Jesus. I'm rotten to the core. So I'm going to stop harping on me because, you know, you guys all know me. You know where I've been and what I've done, especially my first cousin sitting back there. <laughs> He's watched me go from one extreme to the other, and he still talks to me. Still love you. <laughs> I love you. All right, so God's love comes with conditions. Oh, buddy, that's not right. God loves me unconditionally. Wrong. He does love you, but he doesn't love you in the condition of sin. He wants you to come to him. God loves with... He loves us all, but we cannot enjoy the everlasting benefits of God's love without accepting his son, Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean just saying, okay, Jesus, will you come into my heart? I have family, and not in this room, who actually said to me, well, I've accepted Jesus into my heart twice. Okay, did you hear yourself? Are you living right? No. You're still doing the things you were doing before you asked Jesus into your heart. You're still acting the way you acted. You still talk the way you talk. You know, Buddy Hyatt used to cuss like a sailor. I mean, I was blankety blank, F and blankety F, F, F all the time because I was stupid and I was not surrendered to God. I was not a new creature, okay? I'm not perfect, but my wife will tell you, that don't come out of my mouth anymore. I'm not going to stand in this pulpit and preach the word and then go slam my hey, I'm not going to do it. And I've got a scripture coming at you here in a minute that tells us why we're not to do that. God's word is real. God's word is alive. And if we will live it, not just read it, if we will live it, we will be so much more blessed. And I don't have to preach this to you guys, but it's in my notes. That those who reject God's son are promised an eternal hell. Amen. And I hope he doesn't see this, but if he does, he can call me out on it if he wants to. I love him. But I had a good friend this week tell me that he does not believe in an eternal hell. Oh, wait a minute. He said literal hell. And I said, no, it's an eternal hell. No, he doesn't believe in a literal hell, like as in a place where you burn forever. He doesn't believe that. And I was somewhat shocked because this person is, I respect him big time and he's a preacher. I was quite taken aback. So I thought, you know what? I better go to God's word and just make sure that I'm not spouting off something that's not in God's word. So um, I went to check to see about literal hell. And Revelation, you can turn it if you want. It's really short. It's Revelation 1, 18. And Jesus tells of holding the keys to death and Hades. Hades is where the dead in Christ go while they await judgment. Those of us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if you are not saved and you're absent from the body, you are not present with the Lord. You go to Hades. All right, let's go to Mark. 
Let's go to Mark 9. I've got my little post-it notes here so you guys don't have to wait while I flip pages. Mark 9, verse 45. I guess I'm going to, I went from being the cussing preacher to being the weeping preacher. That's okay. Yeah. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it sure is. And I'm thankful for that. I'm That's thankful fine. that the Holy Spirit got that my attention. Good. All right, Mark 9, 45. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. Now, what does that say to you? Gasp. That's a place. Yeah. Hell is a place. You're not going to be thrown into uh, not existing anymore where you're just, you're just gone. And it says also here, this backs it up, and if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die. Here, here's the good part. And the fire is not quenched. That don't sound like much fun to me. So my friend that doesn't believe in a literal hell must have skipped this verse. And it goes on in 49, it says, everyone will be salted with fire. All right. So I'm afraid he's a little bit misaligned there. And he may call me and say, buddy, that's not what I meant. But I sure thought that's what he meant. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 28, Matthew 10, verse 28. And this is me digging in here going, hey, wait a minute. You know, I need to make sure that I didn't pop off in a recording studio in front of a bunch of people and, and shoot my mouth off and not know what I'm talking about. But I know there's a hell and I know there's a heaven. And I asked this gentleman, I said, if there's no hell, why did Jesus die on the cross? He said, forget the Old Testament. Oh, uh, okay, well, no thank you. And this is in my notes, uh, and I probably will jump ahead of myself. But without the Old Testament, how do we know about the wrath of God? And why should we want to be holy if there's no hell? I can do what I want to do. I don't, there's no consequence. I can be as rotten as I used to be running around the world with a rock and roll band, you know, not accountable to anybody. I was accountable to God, I just didn't know it. All right, Matthew 10, verse 28. Make sure I'm on the right page. Yes, I am. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of, outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head, there's quite a few of them gone by now, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth much more than sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. All right, all these dysfunctional families, here's a good explanation. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. All right, I'm going to go on and read a little more here. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, I'm fixing to get in that motorhome out there and go to California with my cousin and his beautiful wife, Lisa, to visit my mom and dad, his aunt and uncle. And I love them. And I know you love your mom and dad. I don't think he's talking about not loving them. But we had better put him first and foremost over anybody, over your mom, your brother, your sister, your kids, anybody. All right, anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's a pretty strong statement right there. 
Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will find it. So I said all that to say he's given us instruction that if we are true Christians and we do not want to go to hell, which none of us are, I'm sure, in this room, I, I feel confident saying that, this is how we have to live. This is how we have to think. This is how we have to feel. It's hard for me to think about not loving my mom and dad or not loving my kids. I do love them. But I let him know every day that I love him first and foremost. So I wrote in my notes, the lesson here is to be careful who and what you love if you love them more than Jesus. God is a jealous God. And he very well may take away whatever it is that is taking your attention off of him. So... I'll put the spotlight on me again. I used to sing for a living. God allowed me to go through throat cancer. He spared me. He saved my life and called me to preach again. And I finally said, yes, Lord, I'll do what you say. If it's to 15 people, if it's to, we've had as little as what, four people show up. I still preach. If it's four people, 15 people, if it gets to 50 people, we'll finish out the other side of this building. If that's the Lord's will. It ain't about numbers, it's about worshiping him. All right, so I'm, a, I'm not pointing this at you, Angela. Angela's mom is sick, and we're praying for her, and we're believing for her healing. But if you have a sick loved one and you're praying for her, that's well and good. If it's his will to heal them here on earth, he will. But if that person is more precious to you than he is, beware. Your job if your job is more important to you than worshiping him, beware. I'm just pointing out a few things that were more important to me than God for a long time, and I had to smack myself upside the head. If your kids are more important to you than spending time in prayer and worshiping the Father, beware. Bottom line, and this is my message in a crux, and I've got a few more pages here of, of little notes and a few scriptures. Bottom line here is read your Bible. I went to church for a long time. I never took my Bible with me, never read it. I just watched the screen. Oh, they're going to put the scriptures on the screen. So I don't need my Bible. What I needed, my Bible, this is my sword. When somebody says to me, forget the Old Testament. Oh, uh, excuse me? Somebody says to me, there's, there's no literal hell. Uh, that's not what God's word says. It's, it's all right here. I mean, I didn't write this book. So... This is minor, and it's not a big deal. But all this time, I've been ignorant to so many things in the Bible. And one, I pointed this out maybe a couple of weeks ago. I've been saying the Lord's Prayer wrong all my life. I've been reading it just as it is. And at the end of it, every time, I thought it said in the Bible, for the for thine is the power, the, uh, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And, of course, thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever, but it's not. That's not in the Scripture. It ends with, uh, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I always heard it was, lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil, for thine is the power of the kingdom and the glory forever. That's not what my Bible says. So the correct way is, end with, deliver us from the evil one. So, little stupid things that I was doing that were not scriptural. When I go to the real word and read it for myself, I'm like, well, you dummy, it was right there. All along, you could have read it. All right, let me go on. You know what I said earlier about forgetting the Old Testament? I wrote down, why would God give us his word only to have us forget half of it? You know, how would we know the very nature of God without the Old Testament? How would we know of his wrath in Genesis 19 when he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with the exception of one family? 
And even then, the wife didn't survive it because she did not follow God's specific command not to look back. So we're not going to go read that because we all know that story about Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. You know, you can think about her when you salt your steak at the chop house. <laughs> or, you know, what about Genesis, and I will read this, Genesis 6, 11. You know, if, if we just decide to throw the Old Testament away because we're just going to go ahead and read the Sermon on the Mount and call it a day, you know, we would not know that we worship a very ferocious God. Yes, he's kind, he's patient, he is loving, he is merciful, he's all of that. But you get on his bad side like these people did in Genesis 6, 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, we know this story. I'm going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Of course, he made a promise not to ever flood the earth again. And we have the rainbow, which has been completely hijacked and distorted and used for very perverse, ungodly things. And yes, if you're watching this on Facebook and you think I'm wrong, go ahead and reach out to me and I'll show you some scripture where I'm not wrong. All right, God's word is flawless. And how can we understand it and live by it if we don't read it? and really seek God while reading it. Pray for the Holy Spirit to enlighten you to what it means. Ask God to explain it to you. Or go to a Spirit-filled Bible reading church that does exactly what we are doing today, reading God's Word. I may not be the best preacher in the world, but I can read. <laughs> and I can read God's Word with you and to you. And if I say something that's wrong, I think that I have enough spirit-filled people right in here today to call me out on it. Say, buddy, that's not what that means. And I'm willing to listen, and I'm willing to go to God's Word with you, and, uh, we, and I don't even care if we do it, you do it in front of everybody. I had a lady last week holler out a scripture to me that I overlooked, and it was very pertinent. She was on the back row, and she hollered it out, and I went, you're right, and we read it, and she was right. All right. I diligently ask the Lord to enlighten me as I read his word, and that's what I'm asking you guys to do. You know, as a preacher, it's my job to impart what the Holy Spirit tells me to you. If I say something from the Bible and I think it means one thing and you think it means another, let's talk about it. Um, I said every word of God is flawless, and Proverbs 30, verse 5, if you want to turn to that, Proverbs 30, verse 5, now I did not put myself a little, I, you guys are going to have to wait on me this time, because I got my notes together and did not put a marker for Proverbs, but I do know where Proverbs is. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Come on, bud. Really? Ah, there it is. All right. God's word is flawless. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And this is the important part. Do not add to his words. And that's what I was doing accidentally with the Lord's Prayer, but I wasn't doing it maliciously. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. So, that's pretty straight up. That's verse 5 and 6, not just verse 5. And I don't need to read any more of that. That tells it straight up that don't add to his word, don't take away from it, read it, meditate on it, pray about it, ask him to uh, enlighten you as to what it means. 
All right, Deuteronomy 12, 32, and you can turn to that if you want to, but I wrote it out here. It says, see that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. All right, so if God tells you something to do, do that. Don't try to help him do it. You do what he says to do. All right, I've got another scripture here, and I did actually write this one out too. But in Matthew, if you want to turn to Matthew 7, 15. And I'm going to harp a little bit here, but I'm going to use the Bible to do it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. There are many false prophets in the world today, and that's my words, not God's word. And Matthew 24, 11 also talks about that. It says, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. I'm going kind of quick through these because they're short little snippets that prove that every preacher that you see on TV is not telling you the truth. I'm not going to call names, but I think you all know who I'm talking about, and there's quite a few of them. All right, Matthew 13, 22 is, is another example of this. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform songs and what signs, excuse me, songs, signs and wonders. I said I could read. Perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, who's the elect? That's us. We're the elect. Are we going to let these people deceive us by not being in God's word daily or weekly or as often as we can? I was deceived. I admit it. I was stupid. I listened to bad preaching. I listened to bad theology. And, you know, I've had people ask me, what, what's your theology? I said, it's right here. Yeah. It ain't my theology. If it ain't here, I'm not going to preach on it. I'm not going to talk about it. I had a good friend of mine come over here and sing the other day. And we're on opposite sides of the political spectrum because I used to sling a bunch of political garbage on Facebook. And he, he probably blocked me, but we're still good friends. And he came, and I gave him a big hug. He gave me a big hug. I ain't seen him in probably a year. And he said, how are you doing? I said, I'm great. I'm doing fine. I said, you know, I just want you to know I'm, I'm preaching now. He, what? I said, yeah, the Lord's called me to preach. He's thinking of all these posts that I used to post that were not exactly appropriate. And I said, dude, nobody cares about my political opinion. And especially nobody that comes to this church. They care about the word of God. They don't care what I think or who I voted for or who I'm going to vote for. They want to hear the word of God and they want to be spiritually fed. And he was just, he was speechless. He, he didn't know what to say. He said, oh, well, uh, I'm glad. That was, he didn't say praise the Lord because I don't know if he's a Christian or not. But I tried to minister to him by just saying, look, I'm different. I'm preaching now. I'm not slinging political garbage on Facebook anymore. All right. So what this is saying about even the elect, us, can be deceived, and a lot of us will be deceived. Maybe not us in this room, hopefully. That scripture says it plainly, that, that the false messiahs are going to perform signs and wonders, and we're going to be going, oh, wow, is, that, is, that, is it you, Lord? No, wait a minute. Bible says that ain't you. So if we know his word, we're not going to fall for that garbage. All right, let me move on here. Uh, you know, and I put a little note in here. I don't have to harp on it, but it blows my mind that these false prophets think they're going to get away with that. They think they're getting away with something. They're not. You can rest assured that God knows every detail of every transaction, good or bad. You know, we make light of, at least I used to, you shall reap what you sow. In other words, you better be nice. If you're not nice, people are not going to be nice to you. That's not what that means exactly. That's part of what it means. But if we sow discord, we're going to reap discord. If we sow love, we're going to reap love. And I have to be honest. I am, I'm very blessed. I have sown 
some good seed because if not, y'all wouldn't be here. If I had not sown some good seed, y'all would not be sitting here with me today as my close personal friends and fellow Christians and brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, I want to make a few more points and then we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm talking about these people think they're getting away with something. We live in a culture that has no fear of God. I would be so afraid to stand up here and for a thousand dollars you can have a miracle. Do you know how many times I've been in a church and heard that? There's somebody out here, the Lord told me there's somebody out here that's going to give $1,000 today. It's going to come back to you a hundredfold. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on toes. Nowhere in this book, and I'm getting a little bit passionate, nowhere in this book does it say that, you, that God is your genie, and nowhere in this book does it say that you can buy a miracle. Now, if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, He will lift you up. You need healing, you need a miracle, you get on your face before him. You get on your knees in private. And you plead with him to have mercy on your soul. Sending money to a preacher is not going to get you to heaven. And it's not going to get your grandmother saved. All right, enough of that. Boy, there's going to be some hate mail come from that. But I'm ready. Y'all bring it. Bring it on. So many people don't fear the Lord. I fear the Lord. I know He loves me. I know He's taking care of me. I know He healed me from cancer. I know He brought me a beautiful wife and kids and a beautiful home and a studio. I'm not a rich man, but I am so blessed. I am so blessed. And I don't deserve any of it. But not because I was cocky and not because I sold a thousand dollars to a TV preacher because I got on my face before the Lord and I said Lord take me or use me I'm no good to you dead but if you want to use me if I'm usable use me okay here we are so I'm going to challenge us and this was me we were so comfortable in our daily lives that it, some of us Nobody, in, I'm sorry, nobody in this room, but maybe somebody's hearing this. If you're so comfortable with your daily life that you're not thinking about where you're going to spend eternity, I challenge you to think about it. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised five minutes from now. You know, I sleep good at night knowing that my sins are forgiven and knowing that my Lord loves me and knowing that when this old heart stops beating, I'm going to be face to face with him. And I'll bring up a good friend of mine that a fantastic drummer was only 66 years old and he was playing a session, having the time of his life. They finished the first song and he fell over dead. Sweet Christian friend of mine. How great would that be to be playing a session with your buddies doing what you love to do, and then bang, you're face to face with Jesus. Joe, I hope you don't die anytime soon, but boy, if you're rocking out on a solo out there with Ray Scott and then you keel over dead, I'm going to be upset and sad for about two minutes because I'm going to know you're face to face with God. That's because I know you and I know your heart. I know you're a man of God. All right, let's look at a couple more scriptures about how we live and and what we believe and why we believe it. John 3, verse 3, says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You know, people in the world go, well, Are these people crazy? You can't be born again. You can climb back in your mother's womb and be born again. And that's in the Word. Somebody actually asked that question in God's Word. I'm not going to pull it up. Being born again means being different than you were before you made the decision to follow Jesus. I wasn't different for 50 years. I asked Jesus into my heart at the age of eight. I thought, well, I'm good. I've got fire insurance. Not. I lived like the devil for 50 more years. But to be born again is to be a new creature in Christ. 
That is, you don't like the same movies. You don't say the same words you used to say. You don't treat people the way you used to treat people. Now, I'm working on Buddy, and you work on you. Ain't none of us going to be perfect. But if you're a new creature in Christ, you have his help. If you ask him daily to help you, you go to his word, you read it, he will speak to you about what he wants you to do and how he wants you to do it. So I'll admit it. I love the world and all of its pleasures. And I live for Buddy, not Jesus. But he got my attention. And if anybody's listening to this, and if you think it can't happen, you're looking at a rotten old you-know-what here that it happened. If he can save me, he can save anybody. All right, we're not supposed to love the world. I'll read a couple more scriptures and we'll call it a day. 1 John 2.15 talks about us as Christians, we need to not love the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. All right, I'm guilty of loving motorhomes and buses. I absolutely love tour buses. And I say love, I don't mean it in the sense that I love it, love it. But these are things that interest me. But I do not love this world. I do not love what's going on in this world. I don't love what's going on with Israel, but I do know that that's a sign that our Lord's coming is very soon. I'm going to keep reading. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. All right? I mean... They're painting the old buddy with a big old broad brush here. That was me. I love the world and everything in it, but I love the Lord more now. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God, there's the kicker right there. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. So if I say I'm a Christian and I don't do the will of God, I'm not going to live forever. If you're a Christian, you will do the will of God and you will ask him what his will is and you will pursue it with gladness. I sound like I'm being authoritative. No, I'm not. I'm just passionate about this because God has shown me that this is what I need to do for me and I'm trying to share my excitement with you. I want to read one more. John 15 let me flip over here. John 15, not 1 John, but back in regular John. It says, If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. And I experienced that running around with a rock and roll band. I was the life of the party. I told all the raunchiest jokes. Uh, you know, I made everybody laugh. And, I, I, you know, I was loved by the world. But as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And thank the Lord he did. I'm so thankful that he chose us out of the world to be his. How terrible would it be to get to judgment day and have him say, depart from me for I never knew you. There is no turning back from that, folks. So, it explains in John 15, 19, that we don't belong to the world. He chose us out of the world, and that's why the world hates us, because it hated him. It hated him, and it's going to hate us. So get ready. We're in the end times. I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher, but I'll tell you right now, if we go to lunch after, after a while and that sky splits open, I'm not going to be surprised. Dark and light don't mix, y'all. So I'm going to wrap up with this. You and me are the temple of God. This building is not a church. We are the church. Our bodies, our mind, our soul. The Holy Spirit dwells within me and you. But you know what I just said? Dark and light don't mix. The Holy Spirit cannot and will not coexist with sin so if we are actively doing something we know is wrong don't be surprised when the Holy Spirit leaves you 
You go to pray and you don't hear anything and you don't feel you feel like it's bouncing off the ceiling. If you're actively in sin, it probably is bouncing off the ceiling. And I'm using that as a metaphor. Sorry if that's not biblically correct, but the Holy Spirit, it is biblically correct that dark and light do not mix, and the Holy Spirit will not coexist with sin. So I hope this is, has been encouraging for you guys. Um, I hope that you will seek the Lord in His Word. I hope that you'll read it often. I hope that you, if you don't understand it, if it's boring to you, I hope that you'll get some uh, study resource material online that'll help explain it or call me or text me. I, I don't know everything, but I'll go to the Word with you. I'll get together with you if you want to meet. I'll sit down with you. Maybe Xander and I, if we have questions, we'll get together at the recording studio and we'll banter back and forth about what do you think this means? Well, I think God says this. Here's what His Word says. So, enough of that. I love y'all, and I hope you'll read your Bible. I hope you read it often. Uh, I will, before I pray for a few people that need healing, and we join together as the body of Christ to pray together, I will say that we won't have a church now for the next three weeks because I'm trying to talk Angela and Ollie into going with me to California. So... <laughs> I have to go and help my elderly parents um, and uh, make some arrangements for them. And uh, I apologize as your pastor, if that's what you want me to be, I will be. I hope that in three weeks we can reconvene. I hope you guys will stay in touch with me. I think I have everybody's number in here. I know I do. I hope we'll stay in touch. And if you guys want to come back, I'd love to have you come back. Uh, I believe, I don't know what date that will be, but I'm gone until the May 20th. So after May 20th, I'm going to fire it back up. And if y'all want to come sing some hymns, we'll do it. And Lauren and Nana, thank you guys for... They're, they're our first timers today. Let's give them a hand. I've known them a long time. They're super sweet people, and I love them to pieces. Love so um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray and close the service and pray for some folks that need prayer. And uh, if you have a prayer request... Don't hesitate to holler it out. Don't be embarrassed because we will pray together. Where two or more are gathered, there I am also. That's what God's Word says. So, dear Lord, Father God, we come to you right now. And we thank you for allowing us to come to you. We thank you for listening when we pray and hearing our grievances, our requests, but also, Lord, hear our praise. We praise you first and foremost. We lift you up. We honor you before we ask for you to help us with what we need help with. So, Lord, right now we honor you and we praise your holy name. We want to bring some people before you, Lord. I know that you already know these people and I know you know what they need, but we want to come to you as a corporate body of Christ and ask for healing. We ask for healing for Lisa Fisher. Lord, I know you're healing her. She's up and walking around. She's doing better. But Lord, uh, we ask you to just do a miracle in her life. We ask you to heal her. Need the blood. Yes, ma'am. I pray for John and Carol this morning for healing and for their ministry, Lord. Pray that you'll get their ministry back on track when they get healed, where they can go back to do the, the work in the church that they did for so many years that they can't do now as they heal. Lord, heal them so they can get back to work for you. I pray for Patrick and his wife and kids to come to know the Lord. We pray that you would send someone into their path that would introduce them to Jesus and that they would fall in love with you as we have. We pray the Lord's hand of protection on our trip to California. I pray for our decision making as we go and as we travel, Lord, keep us safe. And Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room today that if they have a health need, a financial need, uh, just a spiritual need, Lord, if, if there's a decision that they're trying to make, that you would make it clear to them how to make that decision. Lord, just make yourself real and known to us, as you always do, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. amen.